Now, if you watch me stream, then it's no surprise that I love Bloodborne. In fact, I have a near-sickening obsession with it. Its world, its story, its flowing combat, its creatures, etc, etc. From Software, I've clearly put in so much love and effort into this wonderful show of horror and suspense. But how does it nail all of these aspects? What makes Yarnum such a wonderfully horrific place to continue coming back to again and again? How has From Software managed to, once again, grip my senses and immerse me in this world of blood and monstrosity? Explanations arrive here, with my ending thoughts on Bloodborne. The city of Yarnum holds some of the best gothic horror architecture I've personally played through in a game to date. Visually, almost every aspect of this city holds some form of minuscule detail, ranging from towering cathedrals and their intricate designs upon and around them, to the small dingy alleyways full of crazed men and beasts with strange statues and gargoyles outlining the many dark passages. I think one of the biggest strengths to Yarnum, however, is that From Software did a good job in making different districts of Yarnum feel unique without making you feel like you had left the city entirely. Old Yarnum feels exactly as it appears, a shabby, abandoned, and older part of the same city. And when one traverses through it, they can see similar styles that evolved from Old Yarnum into Central Yarnum and the rest of the city, whilst still maintaining its own personal identity. This sort of thing plays throughout the rest of Yarnum. Everything feels like it belongs in the world, and this is applied to the spaces outside of the city as well. The Forbidden Woods offer a sense of dread as the trees loom over you like Yarnum's buildings. And what may have been once a lush forest is now filled with demented creatures and ravenous piles of snakes. Tension is always around with numerous beasts and insane men, but we'll get to creatures soon. Past the Forbidden Woods lies Bergenworth, a college upon the borders of a great lake. And while this area is a small one with minimal encounters, it acts as the doorway to many new haunting secrets within Bloodborne. Well, once you beat the boss. Every location adds to the vastness of Bloodborne's fascinating world. And like its predecessor, the Dark Souls series, the world is very interconnected and does show just how much effort From Software puts within its worlds. The world sections in Bloodborne do one simple thing that is core to this game's tone. They put the player in multiple moments of discomfort and anxiety, but in a way that is engaging and keeps the player's interest. And this remains true of the other sections of Bloodborne that I haven't even mentioned, such as the Nightmare of Mensis, Upper Cathedral Ward, the Sewers, the list continues. The city of Yarnum in the Nightmare Realm is a well-crafted and atmospheric place to explore. Just watch every shadow, as you'll likely find some beast or creature ready to slaughter your hunter. Bloodborne's residential horrors are nothing short of gut-wrenching. Many crave blood, and others simply have to pick you up to kill you if you're not prepared. I understand horror is subjective, and while at face value these beasts may not be as frightening as others, the true terror comes into how they act and maneuver. These werewolves were once men, but no longer attain anything like that of a human. And it's quite disturbing when you see all of these other mobs of angry men, who are just deforming, slowly turning into the four-legged beasts. Disturbing implications arise as you talk to certain NPCs, who are slowly turning themselves, and you can hear the awful pain they're going through. Or the others who are simply affected by this, and start losing their minds, going crazy. Other such terrifying creatures come in many strange forms. Whether it's men too large for anything normal to the human mind, a mass of squirming tentacles, or alien-like beasts our minds cannot even comprehend until we are driven to madness and death. Yarnum is plagued with many strange creatures and abominations. But the monstrosities in Bloodborne come in more forms than just these strange creatures. There is one particular beast in this game that is by far one of the worst and most challenging you will ever face in this game. As you go through Yarnum, you'll encounter various others like you, a hunter. They have their full arsenal of trick weapons and deadly backup plans at their disposal. These guys are by far some of the worst beasts in the game. What separates you from them is that you the player maintain your sanity, well, sort of, 
while these others do not. No better example of these type of hunters is the second boss you encounter in the game. Father Gascoigne is still to this day a boss that gives me anxiety and stress while fighting. He's a great representation of a man going mad, and represents almost every other hunter you encounter in the game, just going mad, driven by insanity. Only by keeping a level head can these particular hunters be killed. This sort of mentality is something Bloodborne excels at. Often you'll see a boss that immediately wins you with despair and doubt. Only by concentration, dedication, and keeping a level mind will you come out the victor. Bloodborne utilizes psychological tactics against the player, and that's exactly the point. The creatures and bosses of this game are supposed to give you a sense of dread and make you feel powerless despite the fact that you continue to increase your abilities. And it does so with flying colors. Every time you defeat a boss, there's always a new and worse sense of dread just around the corner waiting to tear you limb from limb. Not many games would take such a risk in making the player feel powerless, but Bloodborne is balanced in a way where you can achieve something that should require higher levels to complete. I think this is why players continue to retry, and retry. Because no matter how underleveled you may be, one thing is certain. If you can make it bleed, you can kill it. Every boss and creature will throw you around like a ragdoll, but you have the advantage of returning while they do not. Every boss and creature also has a weakness and ways to exploit their attacks. Some may be quick and require more dodges, while others may be slow and far easier to parry. But when a boss kills a player, it's generally the fault of the player. Aesthetically, every creature is unique, and From Software continues to develop not only beings that look terrifying, but beasts that look appropriate to their location and their own history. The men of Yarnum slowly turning into werewolves as the blood within them brings out their beasthood. Or those studying in Bergenworth in the School of Mensis, having more tentacles and alien-like disfigurements. No creature looks gross without a reason, and that is an attention to detail I will always applaud. Combat is something from software has been very good at for years, and Bloodborne is another checked box for great combat. It's engaging, it's aggressive, and it forces the player to take risks they may not have taken in previous Souls games. The one major and most known change in combat is the lack of a shield. Bloodborne opts in for parries instead, and for someone such as myself who is terrible at parrying, well, <laughs> brace yourself for this game. Guns in Bloodborne was a genius idea. It forced myself to learn the moves of each enemy, and when to fire. Guns can do damage, but it isn't their main focus. However, as flashy as guns are, they do pale in comparison to their primary weapon counterparts. Bloodborne has a wide variety of weapons, but this isn't your typical game that supplies you with one primary and one secondary. At a glance, it may seem that way, but in reality, you are wielding three weapons at a time since the very start. Every hunter has a trick up their sleeve, and it comes in the form of a new style of weapon within each of their primary weapons. A simple cane becomes a lashing whip. A small dagger becomes two razor-thin daggers of death. A small sword can become a gigantic hammer. Spears can become shotguns. The list goes on. The trick weapons flow elegantly, and each one feels very different to the other, including when they're in their trick forms. A standard fight between you and another hunter beast, or boss, becomes an exotic dance of death and bloodshed. Another feature of the combat is the new health system. Bloodborne is generous with its blood vials, which is the game's way for players to heal. However, healing is only one way to return health to you. In being so aggressive with its combat, Bloodborne rewards players who prefer to get up close and personal with every enemy they encounter. If a player gets hit losing HP, they have a few seconds to get in and return that lost HP by getting hits in on the specific target. This HP system was an absolute joy for me, as getting up close and personal is my preferred way of fighting. All in all, these combat systems in Bloodborne are fantastic, addicting, and one of my personal favorites in any game. The game rewards risk and in return makes you look like a badass, even when you die that hundredth time. <laughs> Now I know for a fact I'm not the only one to bring up Bloodborne's story, and personally there's so much to cover that I won't for sake of this video. However, in brief, it is easily one of the best Lovecraftian based stories I've come across thus far in a game. Similar to Dark Souls, Bloodborne tells its story through the many items, weapons, armors, etc. the player finds in-game. 
but Bloodborne also relies heavily on its visuals to tell stories. Like I said earlier about the beasts and creatures, things are placed in the world for a reason, and From takes good care to make sure details are accounted for and are placed where they need to be. It isn't obviously thrown into your face, and it doesn't need to. It's because of this that Bloodborne's disturbing and tragic tales are told so effectively. If you are a fan of Lovecraftian tales, then I suggest you take a look at this game's story. You may just appreciate how much depth there is to it. Music doesn't play often through the experience of Bloodborne. Mostly during boss fights, or on an occasion where you hear cultists chanting to the moon. But this actually is a good thing in my opinion. The lack of constant music really provides the player with a sense of loneliness, and adds to the tension of exploring more of Yharnam. When music does play, it serves to only up the tension of an already hard and terrifying boss fight. Ryan Ammon did an incredible job with Bloodborne score, and many pieces stand out that are easily some of my favorite pieces of score in general. From Software have truly created something special here, and this little brief opinion piece is not doing it as much justice as it should. Bloodborne is a terrifying dive into madness and death, a thrilling ride that deserves full attention. I would recommend this game to anyone who has or hasn't tried a Souls-related game. It's an experience that I will not be forgetting, and one that I will undoubtedly return to again and again. But hey, those are just my ending thoughts on From Software's Bloodborne. Bloodborne.